Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the, this afternoon's um, very important session on visa openness. We talk so much here this week in Kigali about connecting Africa's resources. How can we connect our resources if we can't travel around the continent, where 55 percent of Af other African nations require visas? So a main driver behind enabling better regional trade, regional movement. It's also the feature of a major study launched this year by uh, the African Development Bank, McKinsey and Company, and the Forum's own Global Agenda Council on Africa. It's tried to launch a process which frees up visa facilitation, enables greater movement around the continent. Everybody has a very tight schedule, so I'm going to keep my remarks to a minimum, but I'm going to first very briefly welcome my panel. To my immediate left, um, Mr. Akinwumi Ayadeji Adesina, we all know is the president of the African Development Bank based in Abidjan, great to see you again. And another co-chair this morning, Dominic Barton, Global Managing Director of McKinsey & Company. Thanks for joining us again. John Morengi, very pleased to have you here this, this afternoon. Chief Thank Executive you. Officer of Rwanda Air. Of course, you've been involved in efforts to open up the skies of Africa, so I'd like to hear your perspective as a business leader. We'll also be joined by Carlos Lopez, Under Secretary General, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, based in Addis. Carlos is unfortunately just uh, uh, tied up on the BBC debate. He's just finishing now, but we're going to start without him. We don't want to wait any longer. President Adesina, maybe I could ask you to start by outlining some of the key findings from the report. Well, thank you, um, and welcome to this uh, session. First is, let me say that, as we all look at the impact of uh, the global commodity price shocks on Africa, um, all eyes have to turn into what really happens in the regional market. I really believe that as we develop the regional markets in Africa, we will reduce the susceptibility of Africa to these global commodity price shocks. And for that to happen, it means that we must expand significantly the level of regional trade we have today. African countries only trade 11% among themselves. And that is far below the rest of the world. If you look at Asia, it's well over 40%. And if you look in Europe, it's about 70%. And so Africa needs a bigger size market, it needs a better integrated market, and it needs to have the mobility of people to be able to move across to do that. Some progress is being made. Already intra-Africa uh, business investments, we talk so much about foreign direct investment, but investments, Africa to Africa investments, have expanded significantly from $10 billion to now $50 billion a year, which is a very good indication of how things are going. Mm -hmm. However, there remains a couple of challenges to being able to succeed with regional trade. First is still high tariff and non-tariff barriers. So you have infrastructure challenges and power on roads and ports and rail and also transnational highways. And you still have sometimes a not very <coughs> favorable business and investment environment. But the most critical thing that we are talking about today it's about the ease of travel. And that's why the African Development Bank launched the Visa Index, Africa Open, uh, Visa Openness Index, together with uh, the McKinsey uh, and also with the Global Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum. Essentially, what is it that we are trying to do? We are trying to drive a continental visa policy reform program for all of Africa. You want to make things very simple. We want to remove many of the challenges and the procedures that are facing many people when they travel. We want to make sure there's reciprocity on visa issuance across countries. And we want to promote talent mobility all across Africa. And this is a very important tool for being able to achieve the Agenda 2063 laid out by the African Union Commission. So what are some of the findings of this uh, report? First is that Africans need visa to travel to 55% of African countries. Africans also need to get visas to travel to 25%. They can only get visa to travel to 25% of the countries. And Africans don't need visas at all to go to only 20% of the countries. And if you look at the issue of openness, if you take East Africa, Central Africa, North Africa and Southern Africa, you find that the openness index is much better for East Africa, but also for West Africa. The openness index is much lower for countries that are the middle income countries. It's more difficult for people to travel. Uh, for example, in uh, the openness index in North Africa is actually much worse than anywhere 
and anywhere else. I think the progress that has been made in the ECOWAS protocol, but also in the East uh, 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 Central Africa protocol, uh, accounts for a lot of the success that has been recorded. What are some of the solutions that we propose in this report? We should make it easier for people to get visas when they arrive um, in Africa. We should have visa-free regional blocks, just like we have at the East Africa community. We should have regional block visas, so you can actually go to a region just like the Schengen, and you, you have that kind of a, 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 a open, open movement. Africa spends a lot of its time on issuing single entry visas, and that's very expensive for travelers and also investors. We should have multiple year visas, 10 year visas. There's no reason why a business person has to go back and get the same visa 10 times. You know, just 10 year visa for business investors to be able to invest across. And we also think it's very important to simplify the visa procedures and also the level of documentation uh, that is uh, required. And finally, is that we must eventually move to the Africa passport that allows Africans to move freely all across Africa. This has been proposed by the African Union Commission. We're strongly supportive of that from the African Development Bank because we think it's going to make Africa to Africa investments much easier. Let me just give you an example of why, how difficult this is. Aliko Dangote, which is Africa's richest man, told me at the Africa CEO Forum that he needed to go to some countries, but they wouldn't let him in. I mean, you don't let your richest African into a country just because of a problem with a visa. That just tells you how difficult that issue is. Just to close, I want to say that this is something we're going to be doing with our partners every year. Uh, we will re uh, uh, release the next one uh, by February of next year. And that information will now begin to look at the cost of actually uh, issuing visas and also to see how we make progress with e-visas uh, in Africa. So we're very delighted about it. We think it's fundamental to how we have labor mobility and labor market integration and also promote investments in Africa. Thank you. Now, Dominic, my simple question to you, with all, all your vast interests at McKinsey & Company, is why you got involved in this scheme? Well, for, for a number of reasons. I think President Adesina did a great job of laying out the context and the benefits from growth, uh, the need for a more regionally integrated economy will lead to more growth. We won't be as dependent on external factors. So there's a lot of the rationale. But to be very selfish about it, when we look at uh, Africa, there are 700 companies that are over the size of $500 million in sales uh, each. Um, and one could say that's small or large. I think it's actually small uh, for the size of this continent and, and where it is. But one of the biggest challenges for those companies in becoming more significant, and by the way, there's not a single African country in the Fortune 500, which I think, again, makes mm -hmm. no sense. And I would really hope that that's going to change. But to be able to grow and build the depth of expertise, you need to scale. And you can't scale if you're just are restricted or limited by your local national market. And so the ability to be able to play across a broader set of borders is vital to the vibrancy of the corporate sector. So at a very selfish level, having more, if I call it, free movement of people uh, and resources is going to make a significant difference to growth um, and, and to the success of these organizations as we, as we go through it. I think that the we're, we're, again, very proud to be part of this effort because I think we have to start somewhere. And I think the benefits of allowing uh, openness of people to move across borders um, w is, is actually a key part of actually um, improving also growth in national economies. I think there's been too much of a view of a zero-sum game. Uh, that, that if I open it up, are, are, are businesses or are there going to be social costs in my national economy that will be badly affected? And evidence shows quite conclusively out there that in regional trade agreements that you have, and I would look particularly to the NAFTA agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, very politically difficult. It, I think it was, it was only passed by one vote in, uh, in Congress when it went through. The combination of those three countries together in terms of what it did for the collective uh, are very, sig uh, very significant, so they're difficult. So again, we have to start somewhere. We're in the digital age, or we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution. 
uh, the, the, the fact that it takes so long, especially for people within Africa to travel in Africa is just a, is an ancient regime in, in our view. So we're excited. I think we need to monitor proce uh, progress. And I think having this index will be an important peer pressure uh, for us to be able to uh, monitor progress and, and really begin to accelerate more of the regional integration. If you can't measure, you can't improve. Uh, a, a brief welcome to Mr. Lopez. Thanks for joining us. We'll let you get your breath back. Let's take the view of the business leader here. So, Mr. Marenghi, what does it mean to you having a, a more freer, liberal regime in terms of getting moving people around the continent as head of Rwanda Air? Oh, my God. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, that's great news to us as uh, uh, operators. Uh, you probably appreciate the difficulty that we go through. First of all, Africa is not rich, as yet to be. And with that, you find that all these barriers that are put by our own governments just keep, keep pulling us back as businesses. To put this into perspective, you, 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 you realize at times that uh, it's so difficult to even get a visa in countries where our people live because there are no embassies in some of these countries. And then you have people having to cross into another country to look for a visa, and that is all, all unnecessary expenditure and time consuming, and get back to, to travel. So that is, and that is traveling within the same African continent. But more to the business, I mean, naturally it will contribute more to, to what we do once it becomes easy and free for people to move from one African country to the other, you can imagine that is all that we would be looking for that uh, would uh, increase the traffic in terms of business. But also something else that uh, I want to throw here. While you're working, or like uh, the president of the ADB just mentioned, like when you're working with the, with the bureaucrats and the politicians for that goodwill, Please also throw in something else that uh, is rarely discussed, and this is uh, from our perspective, uh, liberalization in the sky. And that is also very important because for now, most of the African sky is not liberalized, so we as operators are extremely uncompetitive. We are exposed to uh, airlines beyond the continent that have f more access to the continent beyond what we as operators within the continent can even access from governments. So it's, it's again a problem, as you put it, where people think that if I open up, probably this is going to, to erode my value. But let me also share that in Rwanda, we have already done it. And I mean, as an airline, we played our part to make sure that happens. We have removed via visa requirements for all Africans traveling in the country. And let me tell you, there are not a million Africans that have been swarming Rwanda to stay illegally or anything. So it has only, uh, from an airline perspective, it has only made us more value, more business, because today you can pick, you can pick up passengers that are transiting out of Kigali, but just because they want to go into town and see friends or even just do some little tourism, stay over for a day or two, and then continue with their journeys and the other way around has always worked. But we are not getting any reciprocation from anywhere else. And I hope uh, this study is going to kind of uh, uh, push our people to get into line. But what I want to say is it's a great idea. I hope it can happen tomorrow. Uh, interesting to see whether there'll be a, a joint momentum for visa openness and, and open skies. Mr. Lopez, you're a, a, uh, alongside your work with Unica, you're a, a chair of the Global Agenda Council on Africa. Why did you select this project as uh, your, your major work stream? Well, we, we are very proud of this work stream and the uh, results it has produced so far. And a word of gratitude here for the African Development Bank that has been behind you know, stabilizing this, uh, uh, this new initiative through uh, support for the research and housing it uh, within um, its various initiatives. And it is part of a larger uh, effort of the Global Africa Council to really give credit to some progress that has been made 
in the reflection about uh, human capital uh, for the development of the continent. Uh, reflection now has to translate into implementation and policy design, uh, and it's happening, and I think this index is going to be part of a, a larger effort that is championed by African Development Bank, uh, ourselves, the Economic Commission for Africa, and the African Union, to uh, expand the discussion about regional integration uh, to a larger number of indicators than trade. Trade is very important, obviously, and uh, by the way, uh, Africa has been progressing on intra-Africa trade more than people think. Uh, over the last uh, five years, about 4% uh, increase, which may sound uh, small, but it's quite significant if you actually contextualize and know that all of this has happened in regions other than uh, North Africa, where you know trade integration is the lowest. But then you have a number of other factors of integration, and human mobility is extremely important. And if you look into the human mo mobility history in Africa, despite our proclamations of Pan-Africanism, it has not been uh, really uh, a very good uh, storyline. Uh, Africans have been protagonists of 27 mass expulsions of uh, migrants from other countries. Uh, this is really tragic, and it continues to happen. Uh, the latest uh, um, uh, example is the debate that uh, was uh, very prominent in South Africa last year. Um, and I think it is uh, for us time to really uh, check what uh, uh, leaders are doing and governments are doing in terms of human mobility and this index is the instrument to actually uh, be able to, to do so. Uh, I think uh, when you regard the continent as being uh, bigger in terms of landmass than China, India, US, and most of uh, Europe combined, and you think that we only have about 90 uh, aerial hubs or aviation hubs and only about 63 sizable ports, you can see how much uh, integration we need really to make progress because this is an indication of failure uh, in, term, in terms of you know, taking into account the opportunities that are offered by a growing market that has already more than a billion uh, people and it's going to grow to two billion by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we are running out of time. I do want to have time for questions. I would just say that you know, having read a bit about the report myself, when it was prepared, the preparation started three years ago, only five African countries offered liberal access to all Africans, but that number leapt to 13 over the three-year period. So there is progress there. Let's see who's got the first question. Gentlemen in the front row, Peter, I know your name, but could you please give it to the rest of us so that our audience online know who you are? My name is Peter Holmes Accord. My question to the panelists is just to get some context for this. What do people think that we're really talking about in terms of the population percentage of America this impacts? Are we really in single, low single digits of Africans that have passports, but substantially higher than that percentage of Africans who cross international borders informally during the year. Aren't we talking about one, maybe 2% of, of Africans who travel on a passport for their international travel? Just getting the context from the panelists. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Lopez, I think that'd be a good place for you to start off. Yes, I, I, I can respond to that. In fact, you know, most of the travel, if you want to call it that way, in Africa is uh, protagonized by migrants that do it informally. You are right. You know, I live in Ethiopia. In over the last uh, six months, more than 100,000 additional refugees enter Ethiopia. Obviously, they didn't have a passport. Um, so human mobility does happen in Africa in great numbers, but not necessarily the formal way. But one explains the other, is because there is absence of uh, human mobility uh, easiness, that you have also situations where people have to find a way, not through the formal means. It's not very different for trade, though. Uh, most of the trade by road in Africa is also illegal. Uh, if you want to call it that way. It's informal. Uh, not necessarily in uh, areas where there is already a high degree of trade integration, like uh, Southern Africa Customs Union. You don't need to do it because it's already part of the single 
uh, market, uh, but in most of the rest of Africa, it is, it is happening all the time. So even our statistics on trade have this uh, deficit of quality that you have rightly pointed out. Let me just say that the, I mean, as somebody who, there was a time I traveled to one country many years ago, and I arrived there, and the problem was because I couldn't get a visa on arrival, I was actually locked up. And um, yeah, I was actually locked up. And uh, this was many years ago. And after a while, they sorted it out because it was a problem of you couldn't get the visa on arrival, but then others that are not Africans who were coming for the same meeting could get the visas on arrival. That's how absurd uh, this is. But to your point in terms of the issue of the proportion that is affects, as you know, if even what it affects is even 5%, if you've got 5% of investors that want to invest a lot of money in other countries, and then the first experience they have is like the kind of experience I have, that's a lot of money you've lost. Maybe you probably have a billionaire that you've turned away, and that's it. And so I think it's not even so much of that is the fact that we want to improve the ease of people traveling and the ease of investment and doing business all across Africa. The second is that when you have like the ECOWAS passport or like the you know, uh, East African community passport here, it's a form of identification. Yes, we want to have mobility, but it has to be, we have to be able to account for who's moving uh, because we also live in a world in which you have a lot of terrorist attacks and a lot of people that have untoward uh, uh, attitudes. So we might be able to track that, and I think that is why we think that you can have a form of identity but we, that identity uh, card must allow you to be able to travel freely, you know, and so I think that's very important. And to Carlos's point, I agree with him. A lot of trade that we have in Africa, it's largely informal trade. But if you don't have documentation sometimes when you make those trades, uh, people, you know, market women get cheated uh, a lot just because they don't have a form of identification. So I think this should help quite a lot uh, by having regional blocks for the, uh, for, uh, for visas, for people to be able to travel back and forth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have no more time for questions. We've got brutal schedules this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here. Wishing you the best of luck. Looking forward to the next Thank year's you. index. Yep. Thank you all for joining us, watching us here, online and in the room as well. Thank you. This is now closed.